Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I am your host, Jason Verlindi. As always, you're hearing John Rauhaus playing in the background, and I just want to thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all for the comments. We hit our 400th episode last week. I think this is probably the longest running guitar podcast in existence. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but we've been doing this for a long time. And every week on the show, I try to talk to somebody interesting from the world of fretted instruments. Today, I'm talking to two of the most insanely talented instrumentalists around, Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley. We've had Trey on the podcast before a long time ago, and they just put out a record where they're not only showing off how well they can play, but they're also showing off how well they can craft a song. It's called Living in a Song. It's a new album that came out a couple of weeks ago. I had a blast talking to these two. We chatted about songwriting. We chatted about gear, chatted about pretty much everything, except I forgot to ask Trey about his Henderson guitar, which I am instantly regretting. Trey, if you are listening to this, you have an open invite. Let's talk Henderson guitars whenever you want. So as you hopefully know, the Fretboard Journal is a lot more than just a podcast. We put out this quarterly magazine that's really more like a book than a magazine, We just put out our 51st issue. You can order that on our website right now. I talked to Jeff Tweedy in there. Derek Trucks is interviewed. We talk about the gear of Jerry Garcia. We interview Franklin Guitars. With every issue, we try to take you behind the scenes, take beautiful photos of workshops and guitar collections. It's like no other magazine around. And I've been doing it for 17 years, and I hope to keep doing it for 17 more years. So I hope you will all subscribe if you haven't yet. It's a great way to support the show and everything that I do online and off. Now, I am known for rambling intros, but I'm not going to do that today. I'm just going to tell you, we have a fretboard summit coming in August, August 24th to 26th. And the lineup, which is not even announced yet, is going to be insane. If anybody wants to go to fretboardsummit.org, they can read up, see if this weekend fits in with their schedule. It's going to be once again at Chicago's Old Town School of Folk Music, one of the great venues in the world. We're going to have a whole 50 exhibitor luthery showcase. We're also going to have some of the wildest and most informative daytime programming imaginable when it comes to music workshops and interactive things you can do. It's going to be a ton of fun. And we also are going to have these world-class performances every evening for you all. It's a great weekend. It's like no other guitar festival, guitar camp you've ever been to. And if you love hearing these interviews and virtually meeting all of these incredible figures at the summit, you actually get to meet them, which is the coolest part of all. Before we get to my conversation with Rob and Trey, I just got to give a shout out to our sponsors. Our friends at Peghead Nation are sponsoring the podcast. Once again, you can use the discount code fretboard when you check out and you will get your first month free or $20 off of any annual subscription. Besides their recurring, take them whenever you want at your own pace classes, they also have a live Zoom workshop with Evie Layden coming up on Clawhammer Banjo. That's on March 11th. And speaking of banjo, our friends at Deering Banjos are sponsoring this podcast once again. They have four almost 50 years now, been creating the finest banjos imaginable from their Southern California facility. These are all American-made banjos at pretty much every price point imaginable. And something that I have neglected to mention before, but I want you to check out is over on their YouTube channel, which is great, by the way, they do during live episodes with some of the real innovators of the music world. They just did one with Evie Layden, who I just mentioned is going to be on Pighead Nation. They've also done some with Valerie June and We Banjo 3 and Mean Mary James. And it's just a great way to connect yourself with the true innovators of this instrument. So check that out. I love that we have all these sponsors. We are also brought to you by our friends at String Joy Strings over in Nashville, Tennessee, makers of some of the best strings imaginable for acoustic and electric guitar. What I love about String Joy is that you can pick your gauges out. You can order bulk. Whether you want nickel wound or pure nickel or coated nickel or phosphor bronze and all points in between, as well as bass strings, they have you covered. Go to stringjoy.com. Tell them the fretboard journal sent you. Last but not least, we're brought to you by our friends at Retrofret Vintage Guitars, retrofret.com, one of the great vintage instrument stores in the world. Now, among the many things that Retrofret has in stock, they received the bookended, the first and last ever Paul Bigsby made instruments, the original first instrument Paul Bigsby made for himself, a lap steel, which was actually written about in the Fretboard Journal's last electric guitar annual. 
They had that for sale. And then they have the last ever instrument, six string guitar that Paul Bigsby made. They had both of these in their inventory. They shot an incredible video that we are sharing on fretboardjournal.com. Jason Laughlin, who was on the Fretboard Journal podcast, an incredible guitarist and instructor, uh, played in that video. Go check that out on fretboardjournal.com if you haven't yet. Again, today's interview is with Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley. They have a new record out called Living in a Song. Two incredible players who also happen to be incredible songwriters, as you're about to hear. I hope you enjoy it. If anybody ever needs to reach out to me, podcast at fretboardjournal.com is the way to do it. We also have a whole bunch of other podcasts like Luthier on Luthier and the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, which you should check out. And here is my conversation with Rob and Trey. Thanks again, everybody. Rob and Trey, thanks for being on the Fretboard Journal podcast. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us, Jason. You guys just released a, a new record. I guess at first listen, this record kind of stood out because, um, you know, all the all the guitar pyrotechnics and playing that you guys are known for is certainly there. But but the songs and the singing really kind of stood out to me right out of the gate. And I didn't know if that was conscious on your part or uh, or not. So so tell me a little bit about this record. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, it was kind of it was kind of the goal with this record was to focus more on our songwriting, you know, and it was uh, kind of a covid related and that okay we're not touring you know and we we but even before covid i think we talked about you know let's try and do a little more country album and a little more um a little more songwriting we've always written some songs on our album but we wrote 10 out of 12 on this one so it was kind of fun to just like kind of like make that the goal and then get her done you know and our our manager was kind of instrumental in hooking us up with a lot of great songwriters here in nashville and um so we probably wrote, you know, 30, 40 songs and then took the 10, you know, that we thought are and our producer, Brent Mayer, you know, was definitely involved in that. And and we should go in for some pre-production with him and just record everything, just Trey and I. And then uh, then we'll pick out, you know, the 10 or 12 that we think go together well. Um, but, yeah, I think there's still plenty of picking on here, but it was kind of a conscious decision. You know, let's let's kind of you know, really focus on the songwriting and, um, and, and support that, which we always do with our playing, but, um, but yeah, it was a little tilted a little more that way, I'd say. Yeah. And, and I think you could, I think for most guitar fanatics and bluegrass lovers and, and folks who gravitate towards your kind of music, like you guys are inseparable. What does the songwriting process look like for you two? Does, does one of you start and the other one finish or like, what's your flow? Uh, you know, it's a little different for each song. Uh, this was different for I think both of us because I, I'd, I'd never really co-written much before. You know, I'd I'd maybe started something and somebody else had finished it or vice versa, but never you know like jointly at the same time worked on a song. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of these songs were like, yeah, somebody would have an idea or somebody would have you know a melody or just a line, you know, and then it would kind of go from there into, you know whatever direction that we all thought it should go in, you know, but it was, it was so different, you know, from my perspective. Um, it was, it was kind of a learning curve, but, uh, it just kind of felt like we fell right into it. But yeah, most of the time, I think for, you know, 99% of these songs, it all just kind of started with an idea, you know, or just one really simple line. And we just kind of expanded on that. I think the only couple that were, um, were different was the title track. I had started that one. Um, while we were on the road and, uh, and then I brought it in and Rob and, uh, our producer Brent had, uh, you know, we, we all finished it together and, and worked on, you know, the ideas and kind of took it in a different direction than I had started. Um, but other than that, yeah, it just kind of seemed like we would just kind of start with an idea, you know, and some days we didn't have anything. We were just kind of starting from thin air, you know, um, and something somebody had said might spark an idea or, or, you know, and that was fun. That was, you know, it's a little scary, but fun. Yeah. I, I like the co-writing experience, you know, because, uh, I don't know, as artists, you're just so critical of your own stuff. And so it's nice to throw an idea out there and then have somebody or several ideas. And then somebody gets excited about one of them. And then it's sort of like passing the baton, you know, and then they'll carry it for a while. And then, uh, we need a we need a guitar 
hook here, you know, and then Trey will throw something out there, an idea. And so, you know, it's it's a team effort and uh, it it can be challenging, but, you know, you get the right people and it's pretty easy, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I I think I once spoke to Anthony DeCosta, who's now living in Nashville, about the whole art of so- of co writing because that seems to be like a specific Nashville thing almost. Um, was there someone besides the two of you that you leaned on the most for co writing? I would think Brent, our producer, was probably the main guy, and I feel like he taught us a lot about co writing. You know, just through it, it was never an intentional thing, but just kind of through osmosis of watching him. You know, it, it, uh, I think it taught us a lot about a lot of things, you know, but, but songwriting in particular, you know, cause he's just such a, a great writer and, and just has a knack for kind of putting together melodies and, you know, he can turn, he can turn the a simple line into something, you know, and, and so it's really cool to be around somebody like that. Yeah. There's one track on the record, uh, just because, and it's funny because, uh, our manager around the time we were putting all these songs together, he's like, and he used to manage Kenny Rogers, you know, and, uh, he says, you guys need to do a love song. You know, you don't have that in your repertoire yet. And I just said, we're too freaking cool for that, man. (laughs) (laughs) No love songs. And then, uh, and then Brent, around that same time, we got together with Brent to, for a writing session, and he had that one started. And I just love the chords and the melody. And, uh, you know, wow. So it just sort of fell into our laps. And and that was a great experience, you know, writing that one with him. Um, and I love that track. It just has a, well, John, our drummer, just crushed it. You know, it just has this just you know, a real simple groove, but I don't know, it's kind of hypnotic and it's got this dobro hook that gets repeated. There's not a solo, you know, it's, um, so it's kind of a nice different, a real different piece, I think for us and, uh, love how it came out. You know, I just, uh, just love it. Yeah. Rob, when you're writing songs, do you do, do you write songs on the dobro? I do. I've done that. You know, that's kind of been my main composition is instrumental stuff in the past, but you know, I was in this bluegrass band for a long time called Blue Highway, and we had three really great writers in that band. They're they're still going, and they're still writing great stuff. And I guess I co-wrote a little bit with some of those guys, but it, some, there were a few songs where it kind of became a band thing, where we were just hanging out, you know, after the gig, and one of them was working on a song, and we'd all kind of throw out ideas. Um, but I felt like I was close to the process, and we would often... You know, as a dobro player, I really pay attention to the lyrics. I always have, even though, you know, I'm mainly an instrumentalist. When I'm playing, I'm listening to what the singer is singing and I try to play what the lyrics are about. Does that make sense? You know? Yeah. I try, yeah. To, I try to create like a sound <laughs> that backs up and, and reinforces whatever the singer is singing about. So I'm always listening to the lyrics. Um And so I feel like I've paid attention to the lyrics, even though I haven't written lyrics much in the past. And it was fun to see if I could, you know, take part in in some songwriting. Um, And um, and also just, you know, like uh, when Trey and I are driving around, you just kind (laughs) of just be a. Well, like there's one song deeper than a dirt road and our co-writer threw that out. And that just had a cool deeper than a dirt road. It just has a rhythm. You kind of get a picture. Um, And so or just, you know, when we're driving around, we'll just kind of try to make each other laugh and just say funny things that are rhyme or rhythmic or it's just kind of a language thing. And I, and I think I've always kind of had fun with that, you know, but um but yeah, so you so so I feel like this is new to me, but I've been kind of paying attention to it for a long time. Yeah. Robbie, you I, I don't know of anybody who's ever just started out on the dobro. Did you start out on guitar? I don't even know. No, you know, when I started, I wanted to play dobro and a lot of family and friends, oh, you gotta start on guitar. You gotta learn some chords first, you know. And I was like, I don't want to play guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and And now, you know, in hindsight, I think I was right, you know, because the dobro is so weird. You know, the left hand technique holding that bar is so different from any other instrument. The sooner you get doing that, the better, you know. So um, 
so yeah, it was my first instrument and it kind of just makes sense to me, you know. Um, what was the first what was the first thing of inspiration because aren't you from California? I am and Dobros are outlawed there. So yeah. it's pretty <laughs> weird. Uh, no. Uh, I, They're from I get there. Lot, you know, <laughs> as a guy from blue, from California get into bluegrass, but my family uh were my grandparents were really into old time fiddle music and my grandpa was a great fiddle player and all his family play. They were kind of Norwegian. He was from North Dakota originally. Minnesota, born in Minnesota. So they had that fiddle tradition is like really important in that whole culture. So I grew up around fiddles, fiddles, fiddles. And um, and my grandpa gave me one when I was seven and I never took it out of the case. And then a few years later, my older brother started playing banjo and then he started bringing home Flat Scruggs records, Jimmy Martin. And I was like, this is freaking cool, you know. And then that first nitty gritty dirt band, Will the Circle Be Unbroken album, that just blew my mind, you know. And then around that same time, I heard Mike Aldridge play. And uh, his first record is just a masterpiece of Dobro music. Still is, you know, still holds up really well. And I heard that record and just like my head exploded, you know, and just been playing ever since then. So, okay. Were you able to find a good instructor or were you pretty self taught? You know, it's weird. I spent a lot of my summers, these same grandparents, my mom's parents, they had a campground up in the Redwoods up in Northern California by south of Eureka. And uh, we would just go up there and stay all summer. You know, it was awesome. And uh, so my grandma starts asking around in this little town, Garberville, hey, you know. She went to the little music stores. Anybody teach Dobro? And and there's this guy and he's great. You know, his name is Ron Stanley. He's still playing. And he came out to the campground once a week and gave me lessons all summer. And it was just perfect, you know. Um, so he got me going on a got off to a good start. And then I just kind of took it from there and had some books and really learned by ear, you know, a learning off records. And once I could do that, I never looked at another book of tablature again, you know. Wow. So so all the songs that you're writing, including the ones with lyrics, it's all Dobro right now. Uh, you mean as far as what I'm thinking about or, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, my head is filled with Dobros. <laughs> did you ever take up the guitar? I don't even know. <laughs> I did. I got, I got pretty good. I could play some Tony Rice licks, you know, I, I got into it in high school and, uh, love Tony Rice and, uh, definitely got into some cross picking stuff and, and it does help, you know, you learn another instrument and it does help tie things together or just open your brain there are more things than dobros out there and, you know, started listening to piano and jazz and blues. And uh, so, yeah, yeah, I think it's definitely good to learn some on another instrument. Yeah. But I have since retired from the guitar. Okay. <laughs> How did you two meet up? When did that start? Uh, I guess I met Rob when I was a kid. Um, I, I played on the Opry with Earl Scruggs when I was 10. And, um, and then I met Rob, a little less than a year later, I guess. Um, I I was playing on another show with Earl, just kind of sitting in with the band, and Rob was in the Earl Scruggs and Friends band, um, and so we played together that night, you know. And then I I you know grew up in East Tennessee and um, got to open quite a few shows for Blue Highway, and I've always been friends with those guys, and um, and so we crossed paths a lot through the years and through the Earl Scruggs and through you know the Blue Highway shows. And then I guess when I moved to Nashville um, around 2013 or so, um, and we started working together then, just kind of, you know, started picking. We did one show, and then we did that uh, Before the Sun Goes Down record, and it's kind of snowballed since then, you know. You guys are, like, inseparable now. Like, do you often – how often are you guys actually, like, in the same room playing with each other? <laughs> Every day. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, it's it's you know, there was something, you know, when Trey moved to town and we started playing together, you know, there was definitely some something happening between us. You know, it just there was a connection musically and just personally, you know, we get along great. And I just couldn't believe how good this guy was. You know, we started having some rehearsals and I'm like, dude, you're like one of the best singers and guitar players on the planet. And he would say, Oh shoot. <laughs> 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 and uh you know and then i i kind of introduced him to some folks and 
I did some showcases for some record labels and, you know, people were like, oh, he doesn't have a band or he does, you know, and I was like, dude, let's just do a record together and get you going because you're incredible, you know, and, um, you know, we had so much fun working together that, uh, you know, we decided just to work together, you know, and, and that's that's what we're doing to this day. And it's just been been a blast, you know, so um, but but as far as how much do we work together? Um, you know, last year was nuts, you know, I mean, we kind of came out of COVID and, and we were just slammed from like fall of 21 to fall of 22. Um, and, uh, you know, really lucky we got to work with our friend Taj Mahal quite a bit, did two, two tours with him. And, um, we also went out with the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band last year and that was amazing. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so we get to play together a lot and um it's uh just amazing. I'm just I'm a huge fan of Trey's, you know. I love working with him, but just as a musician, I'm just a huge fan. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Trey, I see all these guitars behind you. Is there one that was like your primary songwriting guitar? Um, you know, for this record, um I think my main one was actually Brent's guitar. Uh, Brent Mayer, our producer, has a, uh, I don't know what the year it is, but it's a, an old J200. Um, and he just kind of had it out, you know. And so he's he's got a great collection of old Gretsch guitars, you know, like arch tops. And, um, and so a lot of times he would be playing, you know, one of those and, and kind of, you know, just beating around on on one of those, and so I would just grab his <laughs> J200 because I didn't have I didn't have anything like that, you know. And that's kind of, you know, quote unquote a songwriter type guitar. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I would have a few different guitars, and so I would bring a different one a lot of the times, you know. Um, and yeah, they all kind of bring something different, you know. And and I like that about that J two hundred because it made me think differently, you know. Mm. Um, it it just and Brent, I think his writing style, you know, is is uh, is just a little a little different than what normally I would have written things in, you know, like I, a lot of times I would write just, you know, either sad country songs or bluegrass songs. And that was my two, I've got my two styles <laughs> and that's what I write in, you know, and Brent brings this kind of cool, um, you know, a lot of the things is, uh, it just kind of remind me of, you know, like traveling Wilbury stuff with Tom Petty and, and yeah. Roy Orbison. And, and so there's just like these cool different, avenues that we went down and uh so it was cool to have that guitar you know and actually i used that one on most of the record um i think outside of way downtown and working on a building i probably used that uh brent's j200 on every song yeah you guys said this was kind of a covid project thing. you had 30 songs and kind of whittled down to 10 did that all happen in the studio like finishing these songs well, we usually do kind of a pre-production meeting with Brent and play, you know, and he records just the two of us, you know, kind of demoing all these songs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think, honestly, we just let him, you know, do his thing. And the next day we got together again and he had, you know, 10 or 12 picked out, even has them in order, you know, album order that he, he kind of hears the whole thing right off the bat. Um but yeah, and I would like to give him a shout out. You know, he's just so great. And he's worked with so many great artists, you know, Willie Nelson, Merle Haggard, the Judds, uh, going back to, you know, he did Duke Ellington's last album, <laughs> Ray, you know, uh, Ray Charles, uh, he mixed Elvis's last hit. Um, so he's got a great track record and, but there's just, personally we get together great he's just totally chill and you know he's a rock star but he doesn't come off like a rock star and uh so anyway we just really enjoy the process with him and it's meeting him and working with him has been a, a career highlight for us for sure that's cool was was there a conversation right out of the gate of like hey we want this album to be more of a songwriter album uh a little bit more country a little less bluegrass yeah, I think for sure when Rob and I talked about it, it's kind of like the last record that we did, uh, World Full of Blues. You know, it wasn't a blues record per se, but it had more of that influence. Mm -hmm. um, and so we we talked about that a little bit before going into it. And for this one, um, I think after the first couple songs, it's like, I think we're writing a country record or or more of a 
country record, you know. And um and it's kinda like the last one. It wasn't a blues record, no more than this one's a quote unquote country record. But, you know, um it just it's what we do and, and you know, it just seemed like a lot of these songs kinda had that same uh vibe and they fit together really well and, and especially the ones that we put on the record, you know. Um but it was definitely talked about like it just seemed like a goal. We're gonna write this record, you know, and if something happens we can't we'll we'll do other songs. But, you know, I think we're gonna try to write this record. And uh and so yeah, it was it was really fun and I think, you know, like we said, that that sort of opened that songwriting door up more so than it was before, you know. It, it uh and still I don't you know, it's it's harder for me to songwrite because I yeah, I've been playing forever, but I haven't been writing forever. So it just still yeah. feels like I'm you know, getting getting up on the, the a horse that I don't know how to ride. <laughs> when when us mere mortals try to write a song, it's usually like three cowboy chords, and then maybe <laughs> it gets a little bit more elaborate. When it's when it's you guys who are like virtuosos, does it start out that way too, or or do they just come out of the gate complex? Some of them stay that way. <laughs> well, Grace. Trey's being very humble. Uh, the way I remember it is like <laughs> a lot of times Trey would throw out the best lines, you know, or or the neatest ideas, you know. Um, he's a great songwriter, you know. Um, and but I think you know what he's saying is we we're we're not as experienced in it as some people that we got to work with. So it's a learning process, and and you know when we get with people we respect it's a great experience and you're always, you're like your spider sense is on full, you know? And so working with Bren or working with some of these other writers, you're paying attention, you know, and you're studying, you're not studying like they're teaching, but you're just being around it. That's a, you know, that's what musicians do. We, we have kind of spider senses and we soak up sub subconscious stuff and turn it into something, you know, vibes or whatever. Um, and so that's that's and that's what happens, you know, when you get some creative people together, they kind of feed off each other. Yeah, and it's funny with this record, it seems like as far as like the chord changes and the melodies and everything, I think they all kind of happened when we were writing, you know, or, or for the most part, it seemed like, you know, it's just funny when I wrote uh, the first part of Living in a Song before I brought it in. Um it had sort of a different rhythmic pattern than I would normally choose. It had maybe slightly different chord changes than I would pick, but it just felt like how the song went, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's funny. I, you know, I, I, I love a lot of songwriter type albums, you know, I think during the pandemic and stuff, I got, you know, a lot of uh, way into, you know, some different things and, and, um, and so, yeah, it's funny. It just seemed to me, it seems like the melody kind of would come with, what we were writing and the chord changes would too, you know? So it, uh, while a few of them lend themselves sort of to being more simplistic chord changes, like, you know, Rob was talking about just because, you know, and, yeah. and it's sort of a simple groove and, um, but you wouldn't want that song to, you know, be 90 miles an hour and, <laughs> and have a bunch of different weird yeah. oddball changes, you know? Yeah. Um, it just, it, I think it was, it came with the territory of, we're going to write these songs, you know, and just being more for the song, you know, just, just whatever the song needs, we're going to try to do that, you know? Yeah. Who were some of the songwriters you were gravitating towards Trey when you were, uh, you know, obviously like the, I got way into the Dylan stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this was around the time that, uh, uh, the Rolling Thunder review, documentary came out on netflix you know and, and i love that era of dylan you know the uh, desire album and um just you know there's a lot of cool things you know uh, around that and then yeah i think i got way in i've always been into tom petty stuff but sort of that um the more songwritery stuff that he did later on um that yeah it's it's definitely not solo centric stuff you know it's, there's not a lot yeah. of solos on those records but just killer songs and, and especially that desire record. I listened to that thing over and over during, um, during the pandemic and just a lot of, you know, cool chord changes and weird ideas that, that I loved, you know? So it, it, and I've always just been into a lot of different things, you know, but, um, yeah, I think that those, those were biggies. Yeah. 
It's a great record, that Dylan record. Rob, what about you? What are you listening to? Oh, you know, I just read this great book on Buddy Emmons recently, you know, greatest pedal steel player ever. And uh, always been a big fan of his. And it's just a great book. It's sort of like the history of country music, the history of the pedal steel, you know, because he started out on lap steel because the pedal steel didn't exist yet. And then he jumped right on the pedal steel thing and then just built one, you know, and designed it, redesigned it. And, um, you know, um, so there's just a lot of country music history, instrument history. And, uh, and, you know, uh, you know, we've been playing with Taj Mahal and, and he's got this guy in the band right now. That's great Hawaiian musician named Bobby Ngano, and he plays lap steel and electric guitar and him and Taj have turned me on to this Hawaiian music that, you know, the dobro is from Hawaii, you know, playing with a bar and, and playing the guitar flat in your lap like that. But I just never went down that road. I think so. I think I heard some stuff early on that wasn't the real deal. And I just it didn't do much for me. So I never really opened that door. And now these guys have sent me the stuff, you know, and I, I have a lot more interest in it. And um and it really is the root of everything that I do, you know. So, and one of the things they taught me was that the tuning that I use, that open G, which is typical bluegrass tuning, that is the first tuning, you know, that uh, Joseph Kekuku did when he, in the 1880s, you know, when he created this style, that was the same tuning that he used. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, of course, when the Western Swing guys got into it, they started making a six, you know, A6 and C6, and then it went into E9 tuning, blah, blah, blah. But uh, but that's kind of cool that I'm playing in the same tuning that it all started in. Uh, I did not know that. So honestly, like a lot of Hawaiian stuff, and, you know, those guys had a way huger effect on – American music than they've gotten credit for so far because everybody was into Hawaiian music, you know, from in the early 1900s to like post-war, post-World War II. Um, and so uh, it's been really fun to take a deeper dive into that. And it's just kind of blowing, blowing my mind and, you know, and kind of getting into the pedal steel. I don't play pedal steel, but you know, they're, they're definitely related. And I love trying to get those sounds on the dobro and there's some slant techniques, some different techniques that I can do to sort of emulate that sound. And it's been fun just to, again, you just kind of listen to it and you, your spider sense is on. And so you can kind of pick up stuff just listening to it, you know? So it's been fun. That's kind of been kind of influencing my playing, especially my left hand technique a lot. Um, so yeah, I guess a lot of, a lot of pedal steel and lap steel stuff, Yeah, which, I, which kind of fits in with this record and, you know, and kind of doing more country flavored kind of things. I, I love that. You're just now finding this world of like Hawaiian, like that's so cool. Yeah. It, it's funny. You know, we play a lot with Tommy Emanuel and, and he was telling me that his mom played lap steel. And some of the first stuff he ever played or heard was Hawaiian music. Mm -hmm. And he knows a ton about Hawaiian music. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, same with Taj Mahal. He tells a story. I think he was seven and he had a homemade radio set when he was a kid um, up in Connecticut or Massachusetts, wherever he's from. Um, and he was dialing around or maybe it was a ham radio. Maybe it was ham radio. And he was dialing around and he got this. Uh, Hawaii calls. Was that the name of the show, the radio show? Yeah. Uh, Hawaii's calling or something. And he had a religious experience, you know, he couldn't believe. And then when he met Bobby and Gano just a few, you know, maybe 10 years ago, Bobby was just warming up and he played one of like that first song that Taj heard when he was a kid. And he said, Hey, you want to join my band? <laughs> and that's how Bobby got in the band, but um, it's powerful music, you know, um, and it can, it can really, really hit you. Yeah. Have you discovered uh King Benny Nawahi yet? Yeah, I don't think so. Send oh, me a link. Insane monster player. He was like the Charlie Parker of the lap steel. Okay. Well, it's funny how all this stuff comes in at once, you know, like my wife was bringing some stuff home from her parents' house and they lived in Hawaii for like five years in the early sixties when it was still paradise, you know, yeah, of course. And she finds this box of Columbia records called the 49th state collection. 
And it's all like this freaking killer, real deal Hawaiian stuff. And so we've been digging through that. And um, oh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, but, uh, oh, yeah, there's another, you know, Bobby sent me these two guys. It's called Evening in the Islands is the name of the album. And check that one out if you haven't heard it yet. But it's Barney Isaacs. And I can't remember the other guy, but he has one hand. <laughs> he plays the shit out of it. <laughs> has a prosthetic hand, you know, about 18, oh, wow. he, was really, he was one of the top players and he worked for the newspaper or printing press or something, had this major injury and uh, a friend, you know, is this, I won't tell you the whole story, but just, you know, <laughs> a friend just said, Hey, come over to the shop, you know, and he built him. I'll send you the, there's a YouTube of him playing like in the seventies, but uh it's one of my favorite albums I've ever heard, man. It's these guys playing together so well. It's beautiful. Mm. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. So it's fun to, you know, that's what we've, I mean, we're kind of like this already, but you know, when we get to hang out with Taj and Tommy Emanuel and these guys, they're still as fired up about music as, as they were when they first started. And so, uh, you know, I feel like we learn a lot from hanging out with these, these guys. Yeah. Is the Taj stuff still happening? Yeah, nothing else on the books right now. We did like half a record with him. You know, he sang on our last record. And then we did half a record with him right before COVID for him. And then I, I hope we can finish that up at some point. Um, but yeah, I hope we get to do some more stuff with him. We we, we kind of joined the band last year for a couple months, and that was amazing. Um, so yeah, it's uh, nothing on the books right now, but I think we'll we'll continue to do stuff with Taj, yeah. Yeah. And we've been talking a bunch about your songwriting, but you also included a Doc Watson song on this new record. Uh, what was the story there? Yeah, this is one that we had been doing um, way downtown for several years now. You know, it's it. Uh, I think it's one of both of our favorite Doc Watson tunes, you know. And um, and so, yeah, when we went in to do the pre-production, I don't know if we... I think we intentionally had it on the list or maybe we were just jamming on it, you know, in the studio. Um, and it got recorded on the pre-production CD that Brent took home and listened to. Uh, but he, he came back all fired up on that one, you know, the, ne the next time we talked and which we were, you know, been wanting to record that song for a long time. And, uh, you know, obviously doc, that's, that's it. That's the gold standard you know for what i do it's, it doesn't get any better than doc so it's you know anytime we get to play a doc watson song i'm <laughs> i'm all on board you know uh and yeah we're just just thrilled to get to record that one yeah have you guys did either of you play with doc i did a few times um okay. ricky skaggs and earl scruggs and doc did an album and a video uh you know quite a while ago and i was on that i played with earl scruggs for about 10 years and um and then i will say one time so you ever been to merle fest you know oh, that yeah. festival yeah. yeah so one year uh blue highway was playing there and i was just warming up backstage and uh he was walking by and he said that sounds like rob ike swarming up back there you know we we had a good hang and i thought okay doc watson recognizes my sound that's i can i can, can retire that. <laughs> yeah yeah so you know play with them a little bit at merle fest a few times and um but uh yeah one of my you know again i think i mentioned that earlier but that circle being broken album that guitar he just he kind of stole the album. I mean, it was, everything's great on there, but he really, really stole the show in some ways. And, um, you know, really painted a picture with his vocals, you know, and just, just amazing. So yeah, big influence on me, even though uh, I'm not a guitarist, I have studied that guy a lot for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to, I did get to play with him one time, um, uh, at actually, I think it was a show, I don't, I think Blue Highway was on it too, but it was in it, this place in Bristol, you know, and, uh, I had a great hang with him, you know, and, and played several songs for him. And then, uh, I kind of left, you know, left, left the backstage area. And then he had somebody come get me again and bring me back in there and just <laughs> start talking about, you know, everything from, you know, Western shows. I mean, it was just great. You know, I had the best, best hang with him and, you know, super, super guy, anybody that's, was ever around him, you know, can, 
can attest to that, but um yeah, yeah, he was he was he was the best. Yeah. I can't help but think, you know, Earl Scruggs and Taj Mahal, both very intimidating people to work for, and you guys have done it <laughs> in very different ways. Yeah, Earl was always super sweet and humble, you know, just so humble. He's just such a rock star. And he always would come up, is your room okay? You know, your hotel room okay? You're, you're happy with everything? <laughs> Very, I think he knew that music was a team effort, you know. And, and I know that, you know, when he and Lester were playing with Bill, it was not a great experience in some ways. You know, Bill... Bill was hard on his bands and he didn't give him any credit and he life on the road was really tough with Bill. And I know this from talking to Earl, you know, I mean, he would talk about it like it was yesterday. And when they got flat and scrubs together, that's one thing, even as a kid, I noticed um, listening to their records, they had the same guys on all their records for about 15 years, you know, maybe a little change here, switch back and forth on fiddle and then when you grow up and you start playing music for a living, you realize that that's because you don't stay somewhere unless you're treated pretty decently, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I, I felt that when I was working with Earl, he cared about how his band was treated and, and wanted everybody to be respected and have a great time, you know. And so... So he was humble. It was, I mean, it was intimidating to work with him because he's such a legend, but uh, he was so freaking cool. And Taj is the same way. I mean, it's funny because, yeah, we kind of joined the band and you would, you know, at Soundcheck, he would say he was very direct about certain things, you know, not to Trey and I so much, but more his band. Hey, I want this. This is the groove I want on this one. Or, you know, or, hey, let's hear that bass line, you know, because he he hears everything. He's a genius, you know. Um, but uh, but I don't know. They're both so fun. It wasn't I wouldn't say intimidating. We we were uh, intimidated just because we were such huge fans and are such huge fans of those two guys. But to work with them was not intimidating, I would say. OK, from I will point. say I was. I was slightly intimidated on the Taj gig, uh, <laughs> just because I'll, I'll just say, um, you know, for several, for, it kind of started out because some some circumstances had happened that Taj was uh, needing me to play his guitar parts for the okay. for the shows, and uh, so we kind of showed up, and that was the only intimidating part was you know, and I love his record so much. I uh, it's one of those things where it's like I felt like I knew him you know, inside and out and and could play those parts. And you say that until you get on stage and you're sitting next to him and you have to kick <laughs> off Queen B. You know, it, it's uh that those first few shows were the were probably the only times I w- was nervous on stage, you know, and it's just you know, I'm kind of shaking to reach for my chorus pedal to get, <laughs> you know, it turned on. But he's so great that it kind of calms your nerves, you know. And okay. and if I was doing something wrong, you know, or or playing something a little differently than he was you know he had a cool way of of saying you know that it was a little different you know i I like what you're doing the way i played it was a little different but it all i don't think he ever you know directly you know said this is the way i want you guys to do this which was cool you know it's like it i'm sure it was intimidating or not intimidating but i'm sure it was different for him to sit up there and not be playing those parts and have some somebody else up there yeah. playing them you know if you've played those parts forever then <laughs> here's somebody else do it. it's gonna be uh, a little different yeah rob, rob gets to relax he always knows he's the best dobro player in the room <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Hon- honestly i do like that about the dobro because nobody <laughs> knows what the hell it is so they can't <laughs> tell you what to do you know uh, like on sessions and stuff they they t- sometimes they'll have real specific parts for every instrument and they look at me and just kind of okay you do what you do <laughs> <laughs> so that's cool. Um, but I will say that, uh, you know, I think I even asked Taj, I said, do you want us to play your parts? Do you want us? Because he wasn't going to be playing guitar on that first run. And he said, no, no, you guys do what you do. That's why I want you guys here. But a few days before the first show, Ta- uh, Trey sent me a video of him playing Queen Bee. It's a very classic guitar, finger pick guitar part, you know, and he just nailed it. I mean, it sounded exactly like Taj. And I, I sent it to Taj and I said, how's this? 
<laughs> and he just said, yes, he can do it, you know? And, uh, and I will say that, you know, kind of on the new record, you know, people think of Trey as primarily a flat picker, you know, but there's some finger picking things on here that are just brilliant, you know, and kind of like, you know, Guy Clark or, you know, just this perfect accompaniment. And then when he plays electric on some of the more aggressive things mm-hmm. on here, it's like burning, you know. Um, and so so I just uh, yeah, Trey's got a very wide palette, you know, musically what he can do. And it, uh, it was fun to put it to use on this album, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Trey, what did you use on this record? What are the guitars? Uh, let's see. I used... Um, I think I used my pre-war, um, uh, dreadnought, the, the D model, uh, uh-huh. from the guys at pre-war up in, uh, Hillsborough. Is that a on, Brazilian uh, one or which one is no, that? No, it's a mahogany, mahogany, it's mahogany. back yeah. sides. And, um, I think I used it on way downtown and working on a building. Uh, and actually I used a, uh, an Epiphone hummingbird on, uh, um, uh, uh, deeper than a dirt road which I don't really, I just had it in the studio that day and it sounded good for that song. And, um, and then for electrics, I used a, um, I've got this, this kind of T style, Tele style guitar that was built by this, uh, friend of mine out here in, in Bristol, uh, this guy, Chuck Tipton. And, um, it's kind of been my main electric guitar for a long time. And, and so I used it and a, um, an Eastman kind of a 335 copy, uh, with a Bigsby for uh, um, back streets off Broadway. It's sort okay. of a kind of a Chad Atkinsy sort of just kind of picking part on that. And um, just because I think I put two electric guitars on there. I put the telly and the 335 with the Bigsby on that one. Um, and then Brent's got a collection of really killer amps. Um, and so I don't, I think on uh, um moonshine run i used a wah pedal and then just cranked his he's got an old 60 a real 65 um deluxe that just sounds incredible and so i think i cranked it to eight and plugged in that wah you know and that was the sound for that uh but yeah i just used his amp and and like i said mostly his guitar for this record yeah what's the uh what's the telly set up like did you did you custom make that uh yeah you know it's um so it's got a huge, huge neck kind of. My main guitar was a, uh, a 58 Les Paul before then. Mm-hmm. And I liked it because the neck felt more like an acoustic guitar. And, uh, and yeah, this Tele just, it kind of played like that, except it had smaller frets. So it's got the more traditional vintage style frets, you know. Um, and then, yeah, I don't even know what the pickups are. I think they're just some Seymour Duncan I think he literally found them in a box, you know, and it's like, oh, I'll try these out. And they ended up sounding really good, you know. Um, That's cool. Yeah, it. I didn't, at that time when I got it, and I still don't, I don't. I didn't know much about electrics, you know, so it's just like, oh, they make different kinds of pickups. You know? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it it, uh, it really does sound great, you know, and, and um, but it's just kind of like basically 52 Tele specs, you know, with the necks a little different, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool guitar. Yeah. And how, how beat up was your pre-war when you got it? How distressed uh, was it? I think it's level zero. It's oh. no longer level zero, but it, uh, <laughs> it was level zero. <laughs> yeah. I didn't, I didn't tell them when I, when I got the, the D model, I just, yeah. I was such a fan of their guitars. It's like, I don't care what you, whatever you guys want to do is cool, you know? And so it was really, it, the only thing I had specific on was the neck width. I had to have a one and three quarter inch nut width, you know? And, um, and so other than that, you know, it's like go wild with it. And, uh, and so I've got two of their guitars. I've got a 12 fret. Um, and both of them, I was just like, yeah, whatever, you know, just, just as long as it's got that same nut width. Um, and so yeah, it didn't have, didn't have scratch on it. And now it's, now it's kind of beat up. It's probably level three now. Got it. <laughs> it's worth I shot a, I haven't shot a BB gun at it yet, but yeah, the day's still young. Yeah, exactly. Rob, what's your what's your Dobro setup? Yeah, um, I recently, you know, I kind of d- stumbled on this guy a few years ago. I played Shearhorn guitars for like 30 years. Do you know him? You know, yeah. Tim? 
Yeah. Really important guy, you know, on the instrument, really changed the 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 whole world of resonator guitars. And um and then a few years ago, Trey and I were teaching at Yorma Kalkinen's camp, and one of my students had a Burl guitar, a B-Y-R-L, Burl Murdoch, uh, BurlGuitars.com. And, uh, you know, she, 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 she wasn't, uh, she was just learning how to play, but I could tell she, every time she hit that thing, it just, you know, and after the second day I said, Hey, can I check out your guitar? And she said, absolutely. And it was one of the best Dobros I'd ever played, you know, I was like, who is this guy? And she, she put us together and then we met just a few weeks later at the IBMA convention in Raleigh, um, and he had a booth set up there and I played all his guitars and I was really impressed. And not only that, but that weekend, um, there was some other Dobro players and builders and they, these guys had great collections. I mean, it's one guy, his name is Bobby Wright. He's a kind of a setup, Dobro setup master. And he's got like, you know, 12 sheer horns and, you know, these Appalachians, just some of the best Dobros in the world. And we had them all together and we were playing them all that night for about three hours. And I kept going back to that burl, you know, I was like, this is a freaking monster guitar. And so he gave me that one and then he gave me another one a few months later. And then we started talking about a signature model. Um, and so that came out, I think, a year and a half ago. Um and it's amazing, man. So I played I played that first one he gave me on most of the record. And then uh, and then I've got the signature model now, um, which you can check out on my website or his website, whatever. But they're a killer. It's Hard Rock Maple. And he did a cool thing on the fretboard where he kind of mixed as a curved design with ebony and, and maple. Um, but uh, loving it. Yeah. So um, and then I have an old uh, probably a 40s Oahu Tone Master lap steel that I played on a few songs on the new record. So it's the Burl and the Oahu Tone Master on this record. I got to ask more about this Burl. Like, I don't know anything about Dobros. I always assume that under the hood, they all have the same like crate engine. <laughs> but does he, is Burl doing some totally unique there that it blew you away like that? You know, it's a good question. I mean, he's a fan of Tim Shearhorns. Um, and so, you know, he does some things like Tim, but, um, you know, what I will say is that um, there, what I look for, one of the things I look for is there's sort of a response time with the Dobro and some of them just, they're in your face immediately. There's no latency, there's no air. <laughs> I don't know how what's happening, but they're just right there. And these guitars have that, you know, it's just the, the, and I think they're just really well made. And so there's a lot of tension and you just pluck that string and it's like, you know, an explosion goes off and they're loud as hell, you know, uh, which never hurts. Um, but it's the tone, you know, it's a combination. I mean, they sound great low. They're great mid range. They sound great up high. Um, and so I don't know enough about him to really know what he's doing. That's different. Uh and he's kind of funny, you know, he's a little bit, uh, what's the word, you know, Tim Shearhorn is very precise. This is this, this will always, this is going to be here and this is how you do it. And Burl's a little more like, oh, I think I'll try this wood, you know, and just throws it together. And it's like, holy crap, that's a killer guitar. I mean, I've played him. He makes them out of all kinds of woods, you know, and they all sound great. So um, I don't really know what he does, but, but I just, I told him just, man, you are on the right track. Just keep doing what you're doing because you're crushing it. And uh, so that's been fun, you know, trying to get, raise his profile and get yeah. him out there more. And because I think he's definitely the the guy right now, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah. In, in, in bluegrass circles with flat pickers, uh, you know, the, everybody gravitates towards, you know, golden era Martins from the 30s. For the most part, everyone's trying to emulate that. In the case of Dobros, are the modern Dobros a little better for the job than the old Dobros? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because I never got into collecting vintage instruments because I just never really liked the old Dobros that much. You know, they're made of plywood and they don't have that much volume. 
And, um, you know, you can set them up and make them sound better. And, you know, there's some great ones out there. Don't get me wrong. But um, but I just never played any that I mean, I bought one, um, you know, a long time ago. And then I sold it a couple of years later because it just wasn't doing much for me, you know. And then when I played a sheer horn, I was like, OK, this is this is where I'm going. You know, this this is a new ball game. And uh, but as far as vintage stuff, it's been fun to get in lap deals because now I can throw my money away on something like other people do. <laughs> hey, lap deals are still relatively cheap, too. Well, that's what makes it even more fun. You know, <laughs> you can get five of them and not have to sell anything, you know, Um and so I have a lot of Oahu tone masters. I probably got like five of them. I have five or six old Rickenbackers that I love. But my latest acquisition is a frying pan. You know what that is? It's 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 an it's the first electric guitar. It was a Rickenbacker, and it's an aluminum guitar. It looks like a frying pan. Just Google first yeah. electric guitar, and you'll see yeah. it. And uh, so a friend of mine was selling it out in California, and they were. So the first electric guitar was 1931, the Rickenbacker frying pan. And this one was made in 32. So it's real early on. The pickup sounds amazing. I mean, when I plug it into the same amp as I had my Tone Master in, it's like way louder. I mean, these things have a lot of gain and they're just, and they sound, they have a real warm tone, like a pedal steel. But when you want to distort and get rock out, they they got that too. So it and it plays like a dobro. Some lap steels, the string spacing is more narrow, or just the strings feel limp, limper. You know, they they you need something really tight because you dig in more when you play laps uh, when you play dobro, and so. Switching from dobro to lap steel doesn't work on every lap steel, but this just feels like a dobro. And so that's kind of my main lap steel now. I'm, I'm loving it. Very cool. This may not be a fair question because you play a thousand times more than most dobro players do and more notes. But do dobros get tired? Do like dobros wear out like even the modern ones? Yeah, I think so. You know, they need some setup. I'm, I'm, I'm not one to. I, li- I think it also gets comfortable. You know, that resonator sits in there for months, and yeah. I really, honestly, don't like to move it. You know, unless there's something major that needs to be changed. If I'm getting a buzz, or you know, um, but I would have Tim Shearhorn like set it up maybe once a year. Or, you know, kind of just just tweak it. And there's stuff with the bridge, like you can get a buzz going, especially on that first string. And it wears funny in the bridge. And so you have to take a, like a banjo string. That's the best way they've taught me this. And you kind of <laughs> wear it out towards the back, towards the tailpiece. And that will kind of take care of that. But, there, you know, that's something that Tim Shearhorn started doing was some weird little routing out of the bridge and the string slots in that bridge that really helps with that response time, you know. So set up is super important on a dobro and i can do a few things but i i I would rather have you know burl or tim work on my guitars because i don't have the patience for it but there are a ton of little tricks that these guys know and you can take a a crappy dobro and turn it into a pretty good dobro if you know what you're doing setup wise um and uh and it's funny we I have a teaching website at bigmusictent.com and and we did a video with this guy Bobby Wright who's that's all he does is dobro setup. He doesn't build, he just does setup and he knows a million little tricks and so we did a like an hour or two video with him, you know, on how to set up your dobro regardless if it's new or old or whatever. Just here's here's 10 things you can do to make your guitar sound better. So, yeah, it's a whole world, man. <laughs> It is. Yeah. I've heard that about banjos too. It's like a whole dark arts. Like there's this whole thing. It is. Oh yeah. These guys will take a resonator, <laughs> tap it with a pencil. Uh-huh. Hear that? That sucks. Now, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, what are you talking about? You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> funny, you know. And and they'll do that literally. And okay, this is a good one. Let's use this one. They don't just put a cone in a red guitar. They'll tap it, and they're looking for a certain ring. And uh, and I just go, you guys are freaking crazy. But you're right. You know, they when they get it in there, they it's it's it works. You know. So yeah, it's a whole whole deep deep dark world. Wow. 
<laughs> well, if anyone wants to learn it, they should go to your website and uh, <laughs> and guys, uh, I congrats on living in a song. It's great. Like it's it's such a cool record, and uh, I'm really happy we were able to talk about it. Yeah, thank you very much, man. Hey, appreciate it. Love what you guys do, man. It's such a fun, such a fun magazine. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I've been been a uh, long time subscriber. Man. It's the best best part of my months is when I get a new episode. So thank you guys. Are yeah, you touring man. with this record? Yeah, we're pretty busy. Uh I think we we kind of get started, you know, this month and tomorrow. we're <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. <laughs> and then we're we're uh we're not done for, for a while. Yeah, we're kinda hitting, you know, uh, uh just kind of all over the place, you know. Yeah. So is it bluegrass it, festivals or is it more like a venue that would do Americana and country? I guess a little of both. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the fun thing about this project is we do lots of different stuff, you know. Uh, we'll do an Americana room or a songwriting thing or a bluegrass festival. And like I said earlier, you know, sometimes we do duo. We're doing more band stuff this year. Um, and so that's what that's one of the one of the great things about this gig is it's always kind of changing up. And, you know, we work with other artists also, which we're going to be doing some this year. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty full calendar. I love it. Thanks again, guys. This was great. It's great chatting with you. And congrats. Thanks, Thanks buddy. Guys. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. All right. That was my conversation with Rob Ikes and Trey Hensley. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, the album is called Living in a Song. Go check it out. Now that you've heard the story behind it, it is a great record. And stay tuned, everybody. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet. We have so many great podcast interviews coming up. You're not going to want to miss any of them. 